All right. Welcome, everyone, to the December edition of the Public Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Joel Green. I'm playing Dr. Frank Summers for the evening. Uh, I'm the project scientist in the Office of Public Outreach, so I work with Frank quite a bit. Um, he is actually currently on a flight back from, I believe, San Francisco as we speak. So he will be back tomorrow. <laughs> but that's too late for tonight. So you're stuck with me. Um, please take a, an example of our holiday greeting cards. Um, one per person, and there might be a few extras left at the end. Our speaker tonight, who will be speaking, I'll give a short introduction uh, prior to that. And uh, our speaker tonight will be Chris, Dr. Christine Chen. Um, I'll introduce you in a moment as, as we get through. Uh, and she will be talking about debris disks and other the formation of young planetary systems. Uh, upcoming talks, upcoming public lecture series talks are January 3rd or 10th. I guess it's TBA. I think that's why Frank has Frank gave me these slides, so you can blame him. Um, I think I think he basically hasn't decided which day it is, the third or the tenth. Um, the February date is set. That is the seventh. Uh, the talk there will be mapping the heavens, and on March seventh uh, will be another talk by uh, uh, by Lauren Corley's from Johns Hopkins, with a TBA title. Um, you've probably already noticed this, but there's still construction on San Martin Drive. Uh, so if you are coming from the south, it's pretty easy. But if you're coming from the north, you've either got to park on University Parkway or drive all the way around. So hopefully everyone found their way here. Easiest to approach from the south. But the good news is this will all stop in the new year. So hopefully this will be the last one of these where you have to worry about this. Uh, and this is the schedule. See, it says through December 2016. So hopefully... The red, so currently the uh, red part and the yellow are the closed parts. The blue part is done. Um, so anyway, the, the, the key is to approach from the south on San Martin Drive. Keep, keep turning. <laughs> um, I think weather does not permit <laughs> us to go to the observatory, uh, but that usually is something that happens afterward. I, I assume relevant um, people know what to do there. <laughs> And uh, I'm just going to give a quick introduction talk about uh, a, a funny experience I had. Rather than, I know Frank sometimes does uh, news and updates, I thought it might be fun to kind of tell you a tale of one of the most unusual observing runs I've been on. Um, and it's called Why I Had a Boeing 747 Almost to Myself. Um, so when, I'm, uh, when people find out I'm an astronomer, the first question I invariably get asked in a kind of angry, aggressive tone is, uh, why is Pluto not a planet anymore? Are people really outraged by this, right? So, th you know, th the, the, correct, the question you should be asking, and I'm sure that, that everyone here has thought about this, the real question is, what is a planet, right? Why is Pluto not one, or is it one? Why should we even be concerned about that? And um, there are many answers to this question about what is a planet. It could be, you could call it a round thing above a certain size. It could be something that orbits a star that doesn't, you know, have a larger object orbiting it or something. And there are lots of semantic definitions. But um, both Christine and I work in the field of formation of planets. And that's the way I think about planets, is a planet is something that formed around a star in its disk. So, I mean, these are the traditional planets, right? These are, this is planet was, the definition of planet until 2006 was just something the ancient Greeks thought wandered in the sky. But the real thing to think about is when you approach uh, a planetary system, I was having a fun discussion at lunch a few days ago about this. Uh, when you, if you, let's say you were on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise or something like that, and you were flying into your star system and you wanted to say something useful about it, you were surveying it, what would you want to know? You'd want to know what are the objects in orbit around the star? What are they made out of? What are they like? How many of each are there? And what temperature are they? What are their gases? Do they have surfaces? And what this is really a question about is, how did we, what we want to understand is how do you form all of these different kinds of objects? Um, our solar system is a uh, morass of different kinds of objects ranging from planetary bodies down to dust particles. Um, and the solar system as it looks today is this kind of neatly organized, mostly neatly organized uh, system with the rocky inner planets, sort of an asteroid belt. That's not the only place where asteroids are, but that's one of the most common places to find them. Uh, the gas giant outer planets, uh, uh, objects from the Kuiper belt with askew orbits, ice dwarfs. Uh, and what's interesting is if you were to rewind the clock 4.5 billion years, 
to when the solar system was less than a million years old, you probably would see it looking something like this a swirling disk of gas with tiny dust particles hanging suspended in that gas, about 100 times as much gas as dust. And that is a planet-making factory. That's where solar systems come from. And we know this because we look at other ones. Um, all of these are ingredients of things that have been found in space using space telescopes. Um, actually, going to skip this one. So how do we know that planets form in these disks? If you take a meteorite, and you carve it open, as this actual meteorite shows. They are mashups of little pebbles that have been plastered together to build into bigger and bigger objects. This is the building blocks of planets. It starts, it may start big or it starts small, but whatever it is, you generate into these massive objects that we know today. So these are agglomerations. And Christine's gonna talk, I suspect, quite a bit about this. So. In order to study the infrared, the most powerful instrument ever developed for infrared study is the James Webb Space Telescope, which it will be controlled upstairs, just one floor above us, after it launches in 2018. About two minutes after that, control will shift to this building. And we're all very excited, and it's a great tool for studying dusty, infrared bright young stars. And here's a picture of me <laughs> in front of the uh, mirrors of the James Webb. So that's, that's going to be in space, what's sitting behind me right there. So that's pretty amazing. Now, when I wanted to study young stars, there's one problem, which is that the telescope that I want to use is sitting in a clean room in Goddard Space Flight Center and not in space. So I had to use the current state of the art in the infrared, which is airborne astronomy. So I'm going to talk not at all about the James Webb Space Telescope and tell you about another tale of a very unusual observatory. Um, in Palmdale, California, with its many residents, and you don't, don't look too closely at the picture, you might see some that you recognize from other shows, um, is a, a, an area called Armstrong Flight Research Center, or Dryden Air Force Base. And in that Air Force Base is an airplane that NASA bought. <laughs> It's not the Vomit Comet. <laughs> so when people think of NASA airplanes, they ask me, oh, did you fly in the Vomit Comet? I said, that's exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do. Flying up and down like, a, you know, that's a, we want super stable. Um, this, is, this is why I would never do well in space. Uh, I just, I would lose, lose my contents of my stomach very quickly. So not the Vomit Comet. It's the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, SOFIA. Um, and what they did was they took a 747, and actually an old-style 747 from the 70s, bought it, and they cut a hole in the side of the plane. Uh, and in that hole is a telescope. So there's a telescope about 2.4 meters in diameter. James Webb is 6.5 meters for comparison. So this is small, but it's larger than most of our ground-based telescopes. And they carry it to 42,000 feet because the atmosphere of our Earth is one of the things that you know, shields us from a lot of things, but it also makes infrared astronomy very tricky. So the li less air that you have to go through, the better it is. That's why we usually put these things into space. Nice thing about an airplane is you can bring it down at the end of the day and do repairs and change out the instruments and things like that. And what's really neat is I can't go to James Webb or Hubble and use them directly. I can fly with Sophia, and in fact, I did. Um, it takes a lot of people to fl plan one of these flights. I have to tell you that uh, on my flight, there were uh, two flight planners, the two pilot or pilot and co-pilot, there was sort of a, a midships person, um, two safety officers, two telescope operators, and two instrument scientists, and an outreach and education specialist, and then six teachers from the California Science Center who come along to check out how science worked. So it was about 20 people on the flight, and that's only a small fraction. When we went through the initial briefing, we had to come up with a flight plan, and so they came up with a plan. They, now they have now this this map, right? So it takes off from Southern California. We can't fly over Mexico for various obscure legal reasons. <laughs> so we, you have to avoid Mexico. You have to avoid military no-fly zones, and you have to fly in such a direction that you can observe your target. So think about this. Right, let me go back for a second. If you look at this airplane, so the telescope can only point out the left side of the plane. So you have to fly the plane such that the direction it's facing has the telescope pointed toward the star you want to look at or the galaxy you want to look at. So you fly it in a straight line as long as you possibly can pointing toward your target with no particular destination in mind. 
Um, this drives air traffic controllers crazy. Uh, and what's one of the neat things is you have a headset because I'll show you later they ripped out all the insulation So it's quite loud inside this plane. It's kind of like being in a noisy bar um, and But you get to listen to the pilot chatter with the very confused air traffic controllers the call sign of the plane is NASA 747 you can follow it on flight aware um, every one of its flights and they're all posted and the <laughs> so the, the the trajectory you make has you have to end up back where you started so you fly for 10 hours and end up nowhere right you're <laughs> you've gone nowhere ultimately but you've done it's been quite a journey on the way so each of the legs of this flight was a different target and my two targets were when we were out over the pacific so we flew around into the pacific just skirting mexico kind of halfway out to hawaii up over Juneau, alaska and back down the entire west coast of the u.s so we had to have contingency plans in case we had to land at Mexico City, Honolulu, Fairbanks. Uh, this was February, and I said, Fair Fairbanks, are you insane? I have a, like a light jacket on for Los Angeles weather. Like if we had to land in Fairbanks in February, I think I would have, you know, jumped out of the, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we didn't, it all went great. Um, this is me before we're getting ready to take off. Uh, I have a little protective reflector so that I don't get run over. Um, you cannot point the camera this way. It turns out there's some other plane in the hangar that they don't want to show. <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's some work they do for someone else. The, uh, that was my seat for takeoff and landing, those chairs at that table. And those were our headsets. So you, you know, when you fly in this thing, you basically, you kind of wait, and then they announce they're taking off, and they go, and you basically just go, you know, pretty sharply upward to get to 42, or at least 39,000 feet as quickly as possible. And uh, once you're up there, it's about five minutes in, they open the door for the telescope. They don't even tell you they're doing it. You would have no idea. It's perfectly pressurized. They open a hole in the side of the plane, and the telescope sticks out in its little harness, where it is kept, you know, incredibly carefully in place. It's kind of an amazing technology. So it's not worried about, we're not worried about wobble and stuff like that. It's, it's basically under control. The safety briefing is a bit more extensive than you would have for a commercial flight, um, but it's a lot more comfortable. So you imagine 20 people in a plane, a 747, where they ripped out most of the seats and put in some computer desks, but it's a cavernous space, actually. Um, so this is a pretty nice flight. Uh, it's a little cold because the insulation's kind of gone from a lot of the sides, and the back third of the plane is a telescope, but it's a pretty neat situation. This is actually, uh, this, this picture um, made me nostalgic because the very first project I ever did as an undergraduate astronomer was to work with Dr. Terry Herter on the forecast camera, uh, which is the red instrument with the Cornell red bear on it. Um, so when I was, uh, about 20 years ago almost, when I was there, uh, I was working on that. I can't say, I well, I say working on it. I was doing a little bit of programming. Anyway, it was fun. It was really nice to be able to use the instrument that I remember being there for some of the testing of when it was first proposed. Um, it's a long life cycle. So it sits. So the, the instrument is out here on the side that I'm on, but it's anchored to the telescope, which is on the far side of that sort of circular, safe-looking thing. So the telescope is inside on the other side in a shock frame. And from this side, you can just sort of see it adjusting and back and forth. Now, the key essentials of the flight are that they have a built-in coffee maker with, with like a bolt that holds the coffee. I don't know. I just imagined hot coffee whipping across the plane at hundreds of miles an hour or something, but nothing happened. Um, there's a microwave oven, and so you bring your snacks on board, and you can have dinner. And it's nice because they left some of the first-class cabin seats, so after your observations are done, you can kind of take a nap. Um, and you can go check out what we're looking at. So you can look at the stars, you can see what our targets are, our amazing science that was ongoing. And the best picture I got of the entire flight, they let, I, I got to fly in the cockpit for a little bit at the top, you know, the jump seat. And the, you know, so that's a pretty open section of the plane. And the nice thing was when we were over Juno, there were the northern, this is a terrible picture, but the northern lights occupied the entire left side of the plane. So it was the most stunning view of the northern lights I'm ever going to get. So that was really probably the best picture of the flight. But we did get some data and some science happened and uh, uh, this, this fun press release on gluttonous stars that you can read and I'm happy to explain some other time. And, uh, you know, my press briefing happened and I was really excited about the big news and, you know, I'm, I hope to go back again soon and uh, 
in terms of the actual science that we discovered, I think I'm going to leave that to our main speaker. Um, let me introduce Dr. Christine Chen. So uh, Christine got, did her undergraduate at Caltech. She's from California originally. She got her PhD from UCLA yes. and uh, became a Spitzer Fellow. So she was working on the Spitzer Space Telescope. She was actually funded directly by their grants program. And uh, she worked on that for a number of years where we collaborated on projects when I was a little wee graduate student. And uh, then she became a, the Miri, one of the Miri instrument scientists here at the Space Telescope Science Institute in 2008. And she remained in that position until this year where she when she became the deputy project scientist for the entire James Webb Space Telescope. So she knows a lot about that and she can tell you a lot about young stars and really cool stuff about planets. And uh, take it away, Christine. Thanks for the introduction, Joel. I'm going to talk about things that are very related to uh, what Joel just kind of uh, told you about. Um, so in particular, like Joel, I'm an infrared astronomer, and I'm also interested in how planetary systems form and evolve. So Joel, uh, the, uh, the targets that Joel was looking at were um, fairly young stars that still have these nascent clouds of gas and dust and are still forming giant planets. Um, the targets that I tend to look at are planetary systems that are somewhat older and that are perhaps more analogous um, to our own solar system, although uh, some of these systems can be young too. The defining difference between the systems that I look at and some of the ones that Joel showed you some nice observations from is the presence or absence of um, molecular gas. So um, if you think about the interstellar medium and what's uh, contained in the region between stars, um, we know that uh, it's largely gas and dust um, uh, with about 100 times more gas uh, by mass um, than dust. And predominantly, a lot of this is contained in molecular hydrogen. For the, the systems that um, I'm going to talk about, um, we think that in the majority of them, uh, the giant planets have already formed. Um, and so in that process, all of the gas that was in the disk has accreted onto the star or accreted onto the atmospheres of Jovian planets or been expelled out of the planetary system. So these are much more analogous to our own solar system than uh, protoplanetary disks. So um, if you were to try to take a high resolution image of some of the systems that I study, these so-called debris disks, um, this is actually a picture that you might see. This is a picture that was obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the advanced camera for surveys. It has what's known as a coronagraphic instrument. Um, so uh, coronagraphs were developed to study the corona of the sun. And essentially, um, what they contain is a, a, a physical mechanism, uh, something mechanical, for blocking out uh, the bright disk of the sun and allowing you to study the faint corona of the star or the sun. And in this particular case, um, what we're doing instead is we're blocking out the light from the central star in the planetary system. And um, by doing so, um, uh, having the possibility then of detecting fainter material around the star, um, whether that is um, uh, faint planets, Jovian mass planets, or lower mass planets, or in this particular case, what you see is a ring of dust, um, which is around this star. So this is uh, the star Fomalhaut. It's uh, one of the nearest uh, stars uh, to our sun. It's about 10 parsecs away. And this is an intermediate mass star, so its mass is about uh, twice the mass of our sun. So when I think of these systems, this is kind of the typical kind of picture that I have in my head. Although um, many of the systems that we observe and try to learn about, we don't have such pretty pictures for. Um, so this is just a quick outline of my talk. Um, so again, many of these systems are very analogous to our solar system. So it's useful to stand back and to think about our solar system and the, um, uh, the demographics of bodies in our solar system. So there are the giant planets, the terrestrial planets, there's asteroids and comets, and there's actually dust as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about the solar system dust. And then there's actually um, forces that act on the dust that rearrange the dust in our solar system. So for example, there's radiation pressure, which um, can blow dust outward. And there's also um, uh, something called pointing robertson drag, uh, which is a relativistic effect, which causes larger dust grains to spiral into the central star. So I'll tell you about some of these forces that rearrange dust in our own solar system. Um, so these populations, this population of dust that we see in our own solar system, 
um, has now been, analogous populations have been seen around other stars, other main sequence, other midlife stars. Um, and I'll tell you about some of the demographics um, from the early IRAS discoveries. And then um, Spitzer was a tremendous boon to this area of study, um, where IRAS discovered maybe about 100 targets. Spitzer told us about maybe 1,000, so an order of magnitude more, and gave us much more detailed um, spectroscopic information about these targets. And then uh, because, as Joel mentioned, I worked on JWST, I'm tremendously excited about the gains that uh, JWST will make, uh, especially in this area of science, and I'll try to give you a hint of what that looks like. Um, so I, I put this outline on top of this really beautiful picture of the night sky, um, and this is just to remind you of what the uh, dust in our solar system looks like. So there is the zodiacal dust um, in our solar system, uh, which is produced, uh, it's in the region of the asteroid belt. And you can see it here um, at a time that's pretty much close to sunset, um, so that you're not looking very far away from the sun. But you can see from the dark site here, this is the Milky Way. And then you can see this sort of linear feature here um, in, in sort of reflected light. This is light that's reflected off of dust grains in our solar system. Again, this is called um, zodiacal light, and it's produced by sunlight scattered off of what's called the zodiacal dust. So this is just a reminder, Joel already uh, spoke about this a little bit, about the bodies that we find in our own solar system. Um, of course, we're the most familiar with the terrestrial planets, um, and there are so many really beautiful um, images of the Jovian planets, and we've learned um, so much about them. Um, but in addition to uh, the planets, there's also a number of populations of minor bodies. Um, uh, so the ones that most people are familiar with are the asteroid belt. So um, these are uh, uh, a kilometer up to tens of kilometer size um, bodies that live between Mars and Jupiter. Um, and then uh, in the uh, outer reaches of the solar system, beyond the orbit of Neptune, there is the Kuiper Belt. Um, and uh, the largest objects in the Kuiper Belt have been uh, named ice dwarf planets. So Joel also mentioned this controversy about what is the status of Pluto. So as you recall, it was originally a planet, but has uh, been reclassified as an ice dwarf planet. So for the most part, all of these objects lay in the zodiacal, um, in, in the zodiacal plane, um, in the plane of the solar system. Um, and, uh, but the last population, which is called the Oort cloud, um, actually lies in a, a spherical distribution around the sun. Um, and these are small bodies that are sort of analogous to Kuiper Belt objects, except for they've been scattered out to very large distances in all different directions from the sun. And this happens because um, uh, the small bodies, for example, in the Kuiper Belt might have migrated into the inner solar system and then gravitationally encountered Jupiter or Saturn and then um, slung into the outer part of the solar system. So when I think about the solar system, um, this is uh, what I think about. Uh, this is the part of the solar system that we're most familiar with, the inner 5 AU with the terrestrial planets and the asteroid belt. And then moving out to the outer solar system, um, you can see the uh, orbits here for the uh, giant planets, the gas giants, um, and then this population of Kuiper belt uh, objects. and. Um, both in the Kuiper Belt and the asteroid belt, those small bodies collide, ground down, and produce dust grains. Um, and then uh, on larger scales, this spherical distribution of small bodies that makes up the Oort cloud. So um, I showed you a nice scattered light image of um, dust in our solar system, um, that beautiful panorama of the Milky Way, and then um, the zodiacal light. Um, this is another way to look at the sky, and this is a, an image that was taken from the infrared astronomical satellite. So this was a, a satellite that launched in uh, 1983, and it surveyed the entire sky in the infrared. So it mapped the sky at 12, 25, 60, and 100 microns. Um, when you look at this map, it doesn't look like most maps that you're familiar with, um, because you're seeing the heat signature um, from uh, bodies um, both in the Milky Way, so this is the galactic plane here, so this is the, our galaxy, um, and then also the heat signature for foreground closer objects. So um, this thing tilted here, this is a dust, the zodiacal dust in our solar system. So you can see the plane of our solar system is canted compared to uh, the plane of the Milky Way. 
So this is to illustrate that when you look at these maps of heat, you're seeing, um, in, in the far infrared, you're looking at maps of heat. And this is an incredibly w efficient way to find dust um, because uh, the dust, for example, that's in our solar system, it absorbs um, sunlight um, from our sun, and that causes the dust grains to heat up to about 230K. And then those dust grains re-radiate um, temperature heat, um, which is detectable um, in the far infrared as light. Um, what's particularly powerful is that with the dust grains is that if you think of a particular mass of stuff um, and small dust grains, you have a lot of surface area for uh, those small dust grains compared to like a, a planet. So if, for example, if you were to imagine Jupiter broken up into micron-sized dust grains, there's much more surface area in those micron-sized dust grains compared to the planet Jupiter. And this is what makes it so easy to detect those dust grains then um, through the infrared thermal emission. So, um, so if this is the zodiacal light, uh, which was uh, mapped so beautifully here by the IRAS satellite, um, you know, it's interesting to try to understand what is the connection between this dust and, for example, the minor bodies in our solar system. Um, so this is a plot showing you um, the orbital parameters of asteroids in the main asteroid belt. In particular, um, the y-axis here shows you the inclination of their orbits plotted as a function of their semi-major axis. And every little dot on this plot represents a single asteroid. Um, a plot like this was first made by an astronomer named Hiriyama in 1918. And one of the stunning things that he discovered was that, um, and you can see this when you look at this more modern plot today, is that there is structure in this plot. So for example, um, there's a gap here, uh, an absence of asteroids. Um, this is the Kirkwood gap. And so this is um, a, a location where if a body was here, it would be in resonance with Jupiter. Um, and that resonance then makes the object unstable, gravitationally unstable, so it gets um, ejected um, out of that orbit. So that's why this whole region is clear. But in addition to structures like that, um, you can actually also see clumping of objects in this plot. And when this was first noticed, um, it was hypothesized uh, that the reason why you have so many objects that are, are in these clumps is that they were originally part of a larger object um, that broke apart into smaller pieces. And so they still retained the overall same orbital parameters um, uh, that you see uh, uh, you know, uh, on this plot. Uh, but there's now a little bit of dispersion um, from having broken up. Uh, you can imagine that um, when you have the breakup of an asteroid, you create not just large objects, but actually a whole size distribution of particles. So not just things that have sizes of a kilometer or 10 kilometers, but things all the way down to fine grain dust, um, things with the size of a micron or so. And those are things that, again, um, have a lot of surface area for their um, mass, and so they're very efficiently warmed up and they very efficiently re-radiate re the, the heat, the energy that they absorb. And so um, one of the really interesting discoveries of the IRAS satellite was um, structures in the zodiacal light, in the zodiacal dust. And in particular, um, so these are uh, sort of zoomed in uh, uh, pictures of the zodiacal light in which you can see that there's actually these bands um, uh, where you have an enhancement of small particles um, in the dust in the inner part of the solar system. Um, you can go through and model in better detail what the orbital parameters are associated with these dust bands, and you find that they're actually coincident um, with, uh, for the particular case of these dust bands, the alpha, beta, and gamma dust bands, their orbital parameters are coincident um, with uh, the uh, Themis, Eos, and Coronis families. And so this tells you that this, these are the small particles um, that were formed when the larger body broke up. So not only do you see the large bodies in this asteroid plot, uh, orbital parameter plot, but then you also see um, in maps of the sky um, the fine dust grains that are created when they break up. So, um, so infrared, a lot of infrared astronomy is about detecting the heat signature um, from dust. And so I just wanted to remind you um, about black body emission and how it works. Um, so this particular plot shows you um, intensity as a function of wavelength. Um, so this side is blue and this side is red. 
for, um, for, in this particular case, it would be stars of various temperatures. So 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 Kelvin. So our sun has a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin, so it's approximately like this 6,000 Kelvin star. So in the particular case of our sun, um, you can see that um, the peak of the light that comes out is at about 5,500 angstroms. It sort of corresponds to um, yellow-green. Um, but if you imagine stars that have decreasing temperatures, um, the peak in this black body um, function actually shifts to the right. And so the energy that comes out for lower and lower temperature stars is redder and redder. So they have redder and redder colors. The other thing that you notice is that as you lower the temperature, the brightness or the intensity of the object also decreases. So when you lower the temperatures for things, um, the radiation becomes uh, longer in wavelength, more red, and uh, it also diminishes, lowers in intensity. Um, so that's one of the major tools that we look at is um, detecting the heat, um, and I'll, I'll tell you more about the observations. Um, uh, for the dust in our particular solar system, it turns out that um, it doesn't really stay put from where it's generated. Um, so you can imagine, for example, um, asteroids that collide together, and as they do so, they grind down and produce little tiny dust grains. It turns out that for the smallest grains in the size distribution, they have a lot of surface area for their volume. So they have a lot of surface area for the mass. And so that actually means that they're not gravitationally bound to the star. And so they act like tiny sails. And so the radiation pressure just drives them, blows them out of our solar system. And so in some sense, there's a minimum size to the dust grains that are in our, are in our solar system. For um, uh, dust grains that are, are larger, they're no longer sensitive um, to radiation pressure in this way. Um, but what happens to them instead is they feel a relativistic effect called pointing Robertson drag. And in that particular case, you can imagine that you're a dust grain orbiting around the star. And as you do so, you feel a headwind of photons from the star. And that causes you to slow down. And so you lose angular momentum and you slowly spiral into the star. So the basic takeaway message is the expectation or what happens in our solar system is that the small grains get radiatively blown out and the large, larger ones spiral into the, into the star. So um, uh, it, it turns out that uh, for our sun, um, there's another effect that uh, brings large dust grains into the star. Um, it's called solar wind drag, and this happens around active stars too. And in this particular case, it's very analogous to pointing Robertson drag, except for the difference is that the star is emitting not only photons, light, but it's also emitting particles, protons. So, um, uh, and you can imagine now that what happens instead is that that orbiting dust grain feels a headwind of these protons of particles, which then cause them to slow down, lose angular momentum, and spiral into the star. So the, the, just the, the main point is just that dust in the solar system gets rearranged in these different ways. So the part that really interests me is um, what do we know about planetary systems around other stars? Um, do, we, uh, do we think that there are lots of other planetary systems that have analogous belts of um, small bodies? Um, and you know, are they, do they play some sort of role in how planetary systems form and evolve? So for example, um, if you think about uh, our solar system and the Earth, um, one of the outstanding questions today is how was water delivered to the Earth? How did the oceans get here? And that's, that's actually something that we don't understand well. And one of the ideas um, for the origin of the oceans um, was essentially they were delivered by comets from the outer solar system. So these minor bodies might actually be a very important source of water um, in extrasolar planetary systems. So the answer is that we've been able to discover um, minor bodies, so asteroid and Kuiper belt populations around other stars. And we do this um, in the infrared. Um, and particularly, this started with the IRAS satellite. So I showed you the beautiful all sky image and then showed you the zodiacal dust bands. Um, this was another one of the key contributions from the IRAS satellite. So um, basically, um, when IRAS was launched, they, the, the astronomers envisioned that they would use nearby A-type stars as calibrators, and they felt that they understood very well um, what the flux from those stars should look like based on um, how they look at visual wavelengths. 
And so basically, if you look at these plots, their um, brightness flux as a function of wavelength. Um, and you can see 12, 25, 16, 100 microns. So these are far infrared wavelengths. And these straight lines show you the expectations that people had for how bright those stars would be. And you can see these error bars show you the actual data. And what's really stunning is that these predictions for how bright the stars were or should be was a factor of 100 or so wrong for these four particular stars. And so when um, this was discovered, it was immediately hypothesized that the reason why um, they're so bright at 60 and 100 microns is because you have circumstellar dust, so dust around the star, which is absorbing light from the star, warming up and re-radiating that energy as thermal emission. Um, and so that's uh, the current understanding. And indeed, when um, astronomers were able to, um, once they identified these uh, interesting candidate targets, um, so in this particular case, this is like Vega, Fulmo, Hout, Beta Pictoris, and Epsilon Eridani, um, they would go to um, other facilities and then try to take a picture of the planetary system. And so uh, one of the first ones that they were able to do this successfully for was Beta Pictoris. This is a more modern image um, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope with the STIS coronagraph in which um, the star has been placed behind um, an occulting wedge. And you can see that there's this bright linear feature. This is a disk that's being seen edge on. Um, and then you can see um, a different stretch here, um, which shows you more clearly this edge on disk. So this again is what you're seeing is heat from small dust grains in this particular system. The really interesting thing about whenever people go out and take images of the system at higher and higher angular resolution is they find detailed structures that imply the presence of planets. So in this particular case, in the case of Beta Pictoris, what you can see is that the inner part of the disk is warped with respect to the outer part of the disk. And um, the, one of the hypotheses for why this is true is essentially that there is a companion that is a planetary mass size thing um, in this planetary system which disrupts the dust and um, uh, forces the dust onto these inclined orbits. If you uh, look at the distance of this warp compared to the star, you can then um, place constraints on the product of the mass of the planet and its distance um, from the central star. And one of the really exciting things is um, in the 20 or 30 years of studying these particular objects, uh, people have been able to refine their understandings of these planetary systems. And so this is now a, um, a even more recent uh, image of the exact same system. This is now ground-based data taken with the very large telescope, uh, ESO, the European facility in Chile. Um, and it's a composite image showing you the disk. But um, now you also see, uh, so the disk is taken with a chronograph, but now you also see um, images of a point source that were discovered um, very close to the star at about 10 AU from the star. Um, this uh, position on the sort of left side here was the discovery epoch, and then it appeared to disappear for a while. And then it reappeared, so it first was detected in 2003 and then was reappeared in 2009. And so um, it is, you're actually seeing then the orbital motion of a giant planet um, in this particular disk, which is consistent with the structures that were seen in the dust um, from the older um, Hubble Space Telescope images. So why do we want to go out and try to study these particular planetary systems? We already learned so much from Kepler and looking at the demographics of planets that are detected through transit or radial velocity or other things. And the answer is that it gives us complementary information. It's very hard with planets to understand what the detailed composition of the planet is um, because really all you ever me uh, measure for like the transiting planets is the mass and the radius and so you get the density of the planet. But in the case of these particular systems, you have the opportunity to actually measure the detailed composition of the material and understand what it's really made of. And um, it also provides insight into particular epochs that were very violent in the formation of our own solar system. And so um, uh, early on um, in the tr in terrestrial planet formation within the first 30 million years, there were a lot of violent collisions um, uh, in which you know, things collided together to build up larger and larger things to form um, Earth. Um, and then at ages of 30 to 100 million years, we know that there were giant collisions in our solar system. So for example, um, we knew that a Mars-sized object called Thea impacted the Earth 
and uh, form the moon. And so, uh, you know, by studying these other systems, we can understand whether or not these events in the history of our solar system are common or rare. So this is just uh, meant to be a nice simulation um, of, I mentioned to you how um, giant impacts were important in the history of our solar system. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Oh, there it goes. Um, and so this is just a simulation of um, the, the moon forming impact and in which the theosized body uh, ran into the Earth on a glancing sort of collision course. And what you see here is basically um, the mantles of the two objects mixed together, um, spin off and condense and eventually form into the moon. And then the core of the impactor actually sunk into um, the, the forming Earth. Um, and so this explains a lot of um, what we know about the, um, the properties of the moon. So, for example, the Apollo astronauts went and collected lunar samples and analyzed um, the composition of those. And it turns out they're very similar to the, the mantle of our own Earth. Um, so we can try and learn about these violent things that happened in our solar system. Um, whether they're giant collisions early on, or we also think that there was a, a, an interesting period in the evolution of our solar system called the period of late heavy bombardment, and that this happened when our solar system had an age of about 700 million years. This is preserved in the crater record of old terrestrial surfaces, um, such as um, the moon, and so uh, these are maps showing you uh, highlighted craters um, left over from the period of late heavy bombardment at about 700 million years. So the prevailing idea for how these craters got to be there is essentially that the giant planets, the locations that we see them at today, are not the locations at which those giant planets formed. The giant planets actually migrated from a different location to where they are today. And as they did so, Jupiter and Saturn crossed um, the two to one resonance. And um, basically the resonance crossing destabilized all of the minor bodies in our solar system, such as the asteroids and the Kuiper belt. And so basically um, all of the uh, minor bodies became chaotic for a brief period and they went all throughout the solar system. And this is sort of, um, you can sort of visualize that um, in this uh, simulation here where the rings show you the orbits of the four outermost planets. And initially you saw all those green dots, which were um, each one represents a Kuiper belt. And then you can see the moment when you cross the two to one resonance and all of those things get destabilized and they go everywhere in the solar system. So these are the kinds of um, periods in the history that we're trying to study. So uh, the tool uh, that I used and, and Joel used as well uh, was the Spitzer Space Telescope. Spitzer launched in 2003, it was cryogenic, or 2004, it was cryogenic. Um, it was liquid helium cooled to about um, four Kelvin, but it was a relatively small telescope. It was only 85 centimeters in uh, diameter. Um, but because it was uh, so cold and in space, um, it had tremendous sensitivity compared to any other facility at working at those wavelengths prior. So wavelengths of, you know, a couple microns to 160 microns. And um, it really enabled for the first time um, solid state infrared spectroscopy of large samples of young disks. And so um, th this is, whoops, that's an excerpt from um, a paper basically trying to illustrate what these solid state features from silicates like olivine look like in the infrared. So um, basically you get a peak, this is like an emission feature around 10 microns and another one at 20 microns. It's really fascinating because just like um, atoms, when you, you can tell the composition of a gas by looking at the spectrum from it, um, you can tell the composition of uh, the dust material by looking at the peak position of, um, for example, of uh, the material that you see the spectrum for in the infrared. But more than that, not only can you tell what it's made of, but you can actually also tell how large the dust grains are. So it turns out that um, the feature actually changes shape. So again, this is brightness as a function of wavelength but the feature changes shape depending on how large the grains are. So for small grains, the feature is um, uh, sort of uh, triangular, so it's tall and pointy. Um, and if, as the grains grow, the feature actually um, becomes more broad and trapezoidal in shape. And so by fitting the shapes of these features, you can tell the composition of the dust and you can also say how big the dust grains are. 
So um, these are some examples of um, spectra um, from uh, targets that I was interested in, um, which actually help to constrain the evolutionary phase of these particular objects. So again, this is flux as a function of wavelength, and then this is again that uh, 10 micron feature, and then here it's harder to see the 20 micron feature, but again the 10 micron feature and the 20 micron feature. You can see in this particular case, it's not purely just simple olivines or peroxine simple silicates. There's actually a number of different materials um, that go into modeling this particular feature, including materials that are altered at high pressures and temperatures. So things like obsidian that you find on Earth, or tektite that you find in the um, ejected uh, envelopes of uh, craters, um, and possibly SiO, silicon monoxide gas. This is the sort of feature that might be indicative of a giant hypervelocity collision. So a collision in which you have a moon forming event because you produce all this material that's uh, altered at high pressures and temperatures um, in the terrestrial planet zone. This is in contrast to something that has a feature like this where you can see the 10 micron feature, the shape of it looks really, really different. And um, this is because when you decompose it, it's made out of um, instead things more like water and amorphous carbon. Um, and so these are very pristine things that you might expect to find in the outer solar system. So this might then tell you about um, a Kuiper belt object from the outer solar system coming into the terrestrial planet zone and um, you know, disintegrating or colliding with um, a terrestrial planet. Um, producing this sort of spectral feature. So spectroscopy, although you know, it's um, not as pretty to look at as nice pictures, um, can actually tell you a lot of really detailed diagnostic information about um, the composition and the evolutionary phase of the target. Um, but you can learn not only about the composition of the targets, but also about the um, spatial distribution of the dust. And this is really relying on the fact that when you look at dust in these systems, the dust that's closest to the star is actually warmest, and the dust that's further away is actually coolest. So this uh, just kind of gives you a broad idea. So if um, you're looking at material that's at 0.1 AU, um, this radiates most strongly at one micron, um, whereas this material here that's at maybe about 100 AU from a solar-like star um, radiates more strongly at 1,000 microns. So basically, in the absence of having a picture that shows you where all the dust is located, you can take um, measurements of the brightness as a function of wavelength and try to invert them to figure out um, where the dust is located. So um, uh, that was a, a project that um, I carried out with an undergraduate student here at Johns Hopkins. We looked at the spectra of some 500 stars. Um, and uh, each one of these postage stamps is um, the brightness as a function of wavelength for um, a bunch of stars. And you can see there's these strong um, sources um, on the blue side. This is the emission from the star. And then the gray things are the emission um, from uh, the dust. And so you can see that in a lot of cases, um, there are sources for which there's not dust very close to the star, but there is dust pretty far away. Um, and this tells us basically um, that um, there is a, an inner region that's devoid of dust. And one of the possibilities for why there's no dust there is that there's a giant planet, which is basically clearing the inner part of the planetary system from dust. So um, just to look at a, a more detailed example, um, this is, again, one of these spectral energy distributions, brightness as a function of wavelength for a particular star, which is HR 8799. And you see here's the big bump from the emission from the star. And then the red stuff here, these are data points, and it's hard to see, but there's some blue data points here too. But you can see that um, at the long wavelengths here at 30 microns or so, that you get emission that's in excess of um, what you expect from the star, and then it actually turns upward a little bit, and then there's these bright points here. Um, essentially, when you try to do the analysis of the, uh, the heat from this system, um, you require having two components, a warmish component and a coldish component. And this is very analogous to like what you might expect our solar system to look like to an observer far away. Um, we have the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt, and then a family of Jovian planets that live in between. And in this particular system, you're seeing kind of the same thing, an asteroid belt and a Kuiper belt and some space in between. And so that seems like a really good place to go look for planets. And indeed, um, uh, there are some astronomers using the Keck telescope in Hawaii 
Um, and uh, they, were, they weren't using a chronograph, but essentially uh, they were uh, having to subtract out the emission from the star so you could see faint things. So that's why there should be a bright star in here, but it's been subtracted out. But they actually discovered the presence of four uh, Jovian mass planets, so planets with masses about 10 Jupiter masses, um, in orbit around this particular star. And those planets happen to fall right in between where the asteroid and Kuiper belts are for this planetary system. So we know that um, there are planetary systems with architectures like our own, but we don't really understand maybe what the context is for our solar system. How common is it or how common or how rare is it? So one of the reasons why I'm tremendously excited about the James Webb Space Telescope is you can just tell by looking at this particular graphic, right? This shows you to scale the difference between the Spitzer Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. So Spitzer was an 85 centimeter telescope. JWST is gonna be a six and a half meter telescope. Spitzer was phenomenal for this area of study in um, being able to survey a large number of stars um, to be able to discover more than a thousand planetary systems with asteroidal or Kuiper belt dust in them. But what JWST is really going to bring to the table is because it has such a much bigger mirror, it has much better angular resolution. And so now instead of seeing an unresolved point, you'll actually be able to look at where the dust is as a function of position, map out the dust in these planetary systems. And it'll do this for hundreds of um, nearby stars. So this is just a direct comparison of what our expectations are. So um, this top panel here, um, this is actually data from the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, this was obtained by Kate Sue and her collaborators. Um, this is uh, data for um, the Vega system, which was uh, observed at 24 microns. And you can see here, because the resolution for Spitzer is so poor, um, essentially you take that um, poor resolution and convolve it with this planetary system and you just get a big blob. Um, but JWST, we expect to have much better angular resolution. And so this panel here shows you simulations of what the possibilities might actually be for the configuration of the dust in this system. Um, this is taking advantage of um, coronagraphs on board JWST to block out the central light from the star. And so um, on the left-hand side, you see a top model and a bottom model. And this is um, without what's called point spread function PSF subtraction. So this is if you were just to use the chronograph and put the star behind the center of the chronograph. And then what people do to um, improve their images is essentially they observe their target star with a chronograph and they observe another star with their chronograph, one that doesn't have anything around it, and they subtract those two images so that they can remove the residual stellar light and then dig in deeper close to the star looking for additional material. So this is a P these are PSF subtracted images um, simulations instead. And then you can see there's two flavors of models here. One where the dust is um, symmetric and here it's not. I mean, the, the key things that you notice here are here. You don't see this inner hole in the disk that's expected to be seen based on what the spectral energy distribution looks like. And then also we have questions about what is the detailed um, distribution of the dust? Is it symmetric or is it asymmetric? Um, there's a possibility that there's a planet in this particular system and it traps um, uh, asteroids or Kuiper belt objects into exterior mean motion resonances and that those bodies collide and grind down and produce dust grains which are radiatively driven out by radiation pressure and blown into these spiral structures that then you might be able to actually see with the James Webb Space Telescope. So we're tremendously excited about what we can do. The other thing that's really exciting is um, uh, before I showed you some spectra um, obtained with Spitzer, and it was just a spectrum of the whole planetary system. But because James Webb Space Telescope has this phenomenal angular resolution, you'll actually be able to take spectra of all the different points in the field because you'll spatially resolve the whole planetary system. And so you'll be able to look at for gradients in the composition of the dust grains as a function of position. So this has actually been carried out for one planetary system, uh, Beta Pictoris, the first one that I showed you um, that had that edge on disk. Um, this has been done from the Subaru telescope in Hawaii. Um, and essentially uh, these are spectra from different little positions in the disk right around 10 microns where that silicate feature is. And if you squint really hard, you can see that the shape of this 10 micron feature actually changes as a function of position along the disk. And it tells you um, where the small grains are located in this disk, 
Um, it turns out that they tend to be, um, it looks like that they're uh, predominantly in three large rings. And it also tells you where the crystalline material is. So where the dust grains that have been annealed um, by interactions with the star are located. And they tend to be located uh, near the orbit center. So, so I just think the, the spectroscopic power of JVST is absolutely amazing. So not only will we be able to take um, this, these kind of uh, spatially resolved thermal emission spectra, but we'll also be able to take, hopefully, um, spatially resolved scattered light spectra. So now instead of looking at the spectrum from the heat generated by these dust grains, you'll be able to look at the spectrum of the reflected light from these dust grains. And this just shows you um, uh, there's an instrument on board uh, called the Near Infrared Spectrograph, NERSPEC. Um, and essentially, it um, has an image slicer. So it divides the field, up, uh, the field of view up into all these little tiny rectangles. These, uh, and then it basically, it disperses the light from each rectangle. So in this way, you'll be able to take spectra at different positions um, for, for, in particular, this particular disk. And this is really interesting in the near infrared because in the near infrared you have access to um, solid state features now not from silicates but from ices. Um, and I think ices are tremendously exciting because I as I mentioned before, we don't understand what the origin of water is in our solar system. Um, and it would be very interesting to understand what the reservoirs of water around other planetary systems look like and whether or not they have the potential to deliver oceans to terrestrial planets there. So uh, this is just my last slide. Um, uh, just the key points that I wanted to say were um, these debris disk systems that I've been showing you the data from. They're analogs of our solar system when it was young or middle-aged, um, and they're common around young stars. Um, mid infrared spectra that we saw of these disks reveal these solid state features that indicate that the dust is composed of silicates. So these are things like olivines, like real materials that we're familiar with um, on our own planet. So for example, if you go to South Point in Hawaii, you can see the olivine, the green sand beach there, and, and it's the same materials. Um, spectral energy distribution analysis, so that was that flux as a function of wavelength analysis, indicates the majority of these debris disk systems possess structure. That means that they have these central clearings, these regions close to the star that are devoid of dust. And it tells us that there's probably something in those cleared out regions that's clearing them out, such as um, uh, a Jovian planet. So planets may be forming or may have already formed um, in these systems. So um, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions people might have. Questions for Dr. Chen. Yeah, so it, it basically, um, the key thing that's important is the dispersion velocity, so the relative velocity between the particles. So if the relative velocity is relatively low, then things tend to stick. But if the relative velocity is very high, then things tend to shatter. So if you think about the early phases of our solar system, the phase that Joel told you about, when there's a lot of gas in the disk, everything is sort of entrained in the gas, and so it moves at approximately the same velocity, and the relative velocities are very low. And so during that phase, especially when you have a lot of gas in the disk, you're in a really strong building phase. But once the gas is dissipated, um, it, you no longer maintain similar, relative, similar velocities in the material going around the star, and so you can get fairly high relative velocities. So things can be going in different directions at fairly good speeds, so that when they actually hit, it's destructive rather than constructive. Right, but there's a little bit of a, I mean, it's not just a, so you're thinking about Kepler's law, yeah. but I mean, in addition to, um, you know, it's not just the orbital velocity because everything doesn't orbit in a perfect plane, right? And so there's different um, semi-major axes, inclinations, eccentricities. I mean, you're in a pile of goo, right? You're this gas and you're traveling through molasses, that is gonna let things sort of gently roll into each other. Whereas if you take the gas, the gas away, it's open season. It's like firing a bullet underwater versus air. Yes. 
Oh, that's really interesting. So um, I think you're. Re Oh, I sh okay, I'll repeat the question, sorry. <laughs> Am I? All right. Uh, the question was, is, is, does any of your research focus on potentially large planets in our own solar system that we haven't found yet, like Planet Nine, that could be way out in these debris disk regions? Yeah, so Planet Nine is, is really fascinating. And unfortunately, um, so I tend to focus on extrasolar planetary systems, so planetary systems outside of our own. But you're, what you're referring to, of course, is um, uh, there's been this really fascinating work, uh, partly uh, out of Caltech, uh, by Mike Brown, and um, I'm blanking on the other fellow's name. Mike Brown, the Pluto killer, I believe. The Pluto killer, <laughs> yes, exactly. Where um, essentially he was, uh, so he was, so he, you may know him as the discoverer of a lot of these uh, ice dwarf planets in the outer solar system. And when he was looking at the orbital properties of those ice dwarf planets, he noticed that there was sort of this coincidence in their um, orbital parameters. That is, they were all sort of grouped together in one place. And you would sort of expect, um, you might naively expect that they should be, they should have sort of more random um, orbital parameters. Um, and so one of the hypotheses essentially that uh, he's been advocating is that there is an additional planet that is um, heretofore um, undetected, um, which is essentially uh, interacting gravitationally with these ice giants and forcing them into uh, these sort of aligned orbits. Yeah. There, there's actually a, a, a fabulous, I should advertise this, Mike uh, uh, has this fabulous Coursera course. I don't know if you've ever seen Coursera, it's an online uh, learning thing. Um, but uh, he has a class called Physics of the Solar System or something like that. Um, and he actually spends two weeks talking about um, small bodies in the outer solar system of, of, of our solar system. Um, it's, it's a great class. Uh, he's a really engaging lecturer. I think he spends the first four weeks talking about Mars. Um, and then I think he talks about life in the universe, too. And that, that hypothesized planet would be quite large, right? I think it's not like a Pluto, is it? No, no, it's like a terrestrial planet. It's like an Earth-sized, I think it's an Earth-sized thing. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, well, these are these are debris disks. They're debris disks, so they're older. So they're this phase. So an accretion disk means that you have stuff accreting onto the star. So that in, inherently means that there's gas in the disk, um, and so all that material is entrained and going onto the star. It's more like a solar system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does the modeling work? Yeah. yeah. So basically, um, this is work that was carried out by my friend Casey Lees um, at APL. And um, he has this uh, huge library of emissivities of different materials. And basically, he does like a minimum chi-squared analysis. So he takes all of these components and um, tries to add them up in some sensible way in order to reproduce the features as best as he can. So you can see in some cases that this might be successful if like, there are features that are at distinct wavelengths so that they can't be created by anything else. But you can see that there are a lot of things where um, you, know, you might have spectral features that are overlapping. And so one of the frustrations with this kind of analysis is actually it's somewhat degenerate. And so you can imagine different mixtures of materials um, giving rise to the same feature, yeah. And so when people do this kind of analysis, basically they have to, you know, if they're being very rigorous about it, they'll go through and do a Monte Carlo analysis. And then basically they'll show you like a probability distribution function. So the likelihood that you have any given material. So it's, it's not just like, oh, it's like 50% is this. It's like, you know, um, the most likely model is that 50% of it is that, but you know, like you know, there's also some probability that it's like you know 30% instead. So. So yeah. just to clarify for the audience, so the 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 um, the, the non-experts, the dash, the lines at the bottom, these olivines, obsidians, etc. Yeah, when you say they're a library, they are, that means that they were measured by. In the laboratory. So with yeah. on Earth, someone took one of these rocks, used a spectrograph to create an actual lab spectrum of that rock. And then we're using it to, to as a, to as a fingerprint for yeah, yeah. for space-based ones. Uh, yes. 
Yeah, the question so was about comets and the source of the oceans. Yeah, so that's actually a really fascinating um, field of research. So basically, um, when <laughs> one of the things about the Earth that we don't really understand well is like um, how much water is on Earth. Um, because, you know, uh, water is incorporated in the Earth at uh, many different locations, including in the deep interior. And so the exact amount of water is not known. Um, one of the ways that people have tried to diagnose what, so the, the fundamental problem is if you look at the location of the Earth where it is today and assume that it formed there, essentially um, the uh, Earth, the proto-Earth is too hot to basically retain water vapor. And so the um, going in hypothesis for people for decades has been that the earth has formed dry because of this. And so that means that like the water had to come from somewhere else. And so um, for a long time, people had um, considered um, comets as the source, source of um, water in, in the ocean. Um, and one of the diagnostic ways that they would try to figure out whether or not this was true was looking at the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in mean ocean seawater. Um, and compare that to the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in comets to see if at all they were common. Um, it, it turned out for a long time the, the distribution of comets that people were probing, um, uh, which I think were from fairly far out in the solar system, they actually had um, a higher deuterium fraction, I think, um, compared to mean ocean seawater. So people were really uncertain. You know, that was not the most favored explanation for the origin of water on Earth. Um, there was, uh, there has, it is still a really active field of research, so um, there was uh, more recent data taken by the Herschel Space Telescope around 2010 or so um, of some of these uh, Trojan objects instead, um, and those actually tended to have D to H ratios that were more similar to mean ocean seawater, so people are not sure what the origin of um, water on the Earth is, so that's one possibility. Another possibility that's, um, I think, become more in vogue um, is the idea that the water is actually delivered by water-rich asteroids. So you remember that scenario that I told you about um, the period of late heavy bombardment and how the migration of the planets destabilized the minor bo bodies in our solar system. Um, it destabilized all of them, including, we think, um, the asteroids in the main asteroid belt. Um, the asteroids that are uh, a little bit further out, um, the outer parts of the asteroid belt, um, are, um, are expected to be somewhat volatile rich. And so um, they have been hypothesized as another source of water um, for the oceans on Earth. Um, we think we have evidence for collisions between those objects and the inner solar system when you look at the cratering record on like the moon or Mars. So you can look at the size distribution, so how many big craters versus how many little craters um, on the moon or Mars or something like that, and look at the size distribution of asteroids, how many big asteroids versus little asteroids. And it turns out the size distribution of asteroids in the main asteroid belt lines up with the size distribution of craters on um, on old terrestrial surfaces. So we know those things got slung in during the period of late heaven bombardment. And based on um, some of the spectroscopic analysis, we think they're water rich too. So they're another, I think right now they're actually probably the more favored source of water on the, on the Earth. What about the burning of hydrocarbons? That produces water also. Right, but that's a small, yeah. Yes, back there. Uh, oh. More question about more clarification for icy planets and Planet Nine. Yeah, that's correct. And so, um, so when this whole controversy was going on about Pluto, essentially what happened was, um, so uh, you know, Pluto was discovered. Shoot, I think like in 1930 or so at Lowell Observatory, and um, you know, it, for a long time it was the only thing kind of known in the outer solar system. And um, basically, in the 1990s, um, Dave Jewett and Jane Liu went out um, and you know, basically carried out these deep surveys of the sky of the ecliptic plane looking for um, you know, additional uh, minor bodies out there. And so um, this led to the discovery of uh, you know, the whole population of Kuiper Belt objects. And so when the Kuiper Belt objects were discovered, you know, uh, you know, and this is again some of Mike Brown's really beautiful work, they discovered that some of the largest Kuiper Belt objects were even bigger than Pluto, right? And so then there became this sort of thing, well, do you consider them planets too? 
And the thing that made them very similar to Pluto was, um, so Pluto is in a three to two resonance with Neptune. And it turns out there's a whole family of other Kuiper Belt objects that are also in the three to two resonance. So Pluto doesn't have a particularly um, you know, unique um, mass or size compared to things in the Kuiper Belt region. And it doesn't have a particularly unique orbit. And so that, that was part of the reasoning that um, the IAU used to demote its status um, from a planet to a Kuiper Belt object because they said, hey, there's so many more of these other objects that are out there. It's really not that special. And you know, maybe it's really one of these other Kuiper Belt objects. And you know, there's a whole like half a dozen of them that instead we're going to designate as ice dwarfs. So things like um, Sedna and other Four, stuff. How about yeah. Oh, okay, so this is not my um, field of expertise, um, but essentially um, what I recall of Mike Brown's analysis is essentially he was looking at the orbital parameters um, for all of those large objects, you know, um, maybe like the largest nine or 12 of them or something like that. And basically um, he noticed uh, that, uh, again, if you expect them to be randomly scattered out or something, they should be all over the place. Um, but he noticed when he made uh, this orbital parameter plot that they were all sort of clumped in one area or at least avoided a particular area of the phase space. And so based on the dynamical evidence, like what the orbits look like, you know, essentially, um, that's where the hypothesis for this planet nine came from, that um, basically it's uh, exerting a gravitational influence on these large objects. Um, we don't see it directly, we just see how the other objects feel its presence. So I, I really recommend to you, um, I think uh, part of that Coursera class that Mike Brown has, um, I think it starts up every three months or something like that, um, because he, uh, he and uh, his colleagues are the uh, lead proponents for this sort of theory. I think he has a lecture in, in this course about it. And it's actually a really excellent class. So if you're interested in the solar system generically, there's a, there's a beautiful, um, the first four weeks are about Mars. Um, I hadn't seen the detailed radar maps for, for Mars and you know, seen how much geology people now know from Mars. It's, it's, it's really spectacular. I, I highly recommend it. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so you can just spraying out and then just accreting. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, if you have a planet like uh, Jupiter, is that shrinking or gaining mass? So in the particular case of Jupiter, um, Jupiter is so massive that essentially. Um, uh, it tends to, its gravity affects things that try to come into where it's located. And most of the time, um, if an object comes in from the outer solar system toward Jupiter, it encounters Jupiter and is actually, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it, it's actually gravitationally slung out of the system. So most of the time, Jupiter doesn't, you know, it doesn't either gain or lose mass. Um, but for smaller objects, um, for some objects, so Comet Linear um, several years ago, or even, shoot, what was it, the, the one Shoemaker-Levy Shoemaker that impacted Jupiter in the late 90s? Yeah. <laughs> that was a clear case of material being accreted onto the planet. Yeah. That was so it when depends. the Hubble had a ringside T2. That's what yeah, right. So, well, I mean, that, I think that's an active area of research where people actually do real dynamical simulations, right? Because they're curious what happens when you imagine implant a planet in a planetary system and watch dust come in and how does it affect it? Because if it's, if it's a small planet, you can imagine the gravity is not so great and so it doesn't affect it as strongly as like a big planet like Jupiter. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. Question about the late heavy bombardment. What so, was it? So this is um, this is yeah. So this is something that's been uh, talked about in planetary science for a while. Um, essentially, uh, people noticed a long time ago that when you looked at old terrestrial planet surfaces, so the surfaces of 
Mercury, Mars, and the Moon, that they had a lot of craters on them. So this is just a map of the near side and the far side of the Moon, and you can see the craters are picked out so you can see them more easily. On the Moon, um, you can see there are periods where there's been geologic resurfacing, where lava has come up to the surface and formed maria, the seas that you see on the surface of the Moon, right? And so um, it was, you know, based on observations like that, you knew that there was a violent period in the early part of the solar system where you had a lot of collisions, um, and you could kind of constrain when that happened based on looking at where the, the like, the properties of the Maria, right? Um, so uh, one of the, the things that um, people have been struggling to understand for a long time is when those observations were first made and noticed, um, people sort of thought that um, all of these collisions happened at the same time, like it was kind of like a delta function, when all the, the cratering, like all the collisions went up, you know, the collision rate went up really high, it just went up really high and came down really fast. Um, there's been a lot of really uh, nice work by uh, uh, and a researcher named Bill Botke, um, particularly, uh, you know, studying uh, these surfaces and trying to understand uh, th this cratering um, period. And I, I, honestly, I, I don't remember uh, the exact details, but my impression has been that over time, um, our thinking of the cratering record is that, you know, essentially these craters are actually formed over time. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, people then are, of course, very interested in what are the mechanisms um, to uh, create the craters. And so um, this idea that I was describing for you, um, uh, this is actually called the Nice model. Um, because uh, it was first hypothesized by um, a number of astronomers in, in Nice in France. Um, and essentially, uh, it, it basically tried to account for um, a number of things, uh, observations that people made of the solar system that seemed sort of startling. So one of them was, for example, when you look at the mass of the asteroid belt and compare it to the mass in the terrestrial planets and the Jovian planets around it, um, if you were to smooth out all of that mass, you actually get a divot in the amount of stuff around the asteroid belt. And so people knew essentially that the asteroid belt, um, the primordial asteroid belt, was actually a lot more massive than the asteroid belt that we see today. Then this sort of leads to the question of like, well, what happened to all of those objects, right? And so, um, you, know, uh, you know, it was noticed that there were these Kirkwood gaps that um, I talked about uh, where you have uh, mean motion resonances, where you, you, you lose material. Um, but uh, uh, the, this Nice model, which has really come into fashion the past few years and described a lot of reasons why you see certain properties of the solar system, such as the diminished asteroid belt, um, is, is, has become the leading explanation. So again, this is that the location of Jupiter and Saturn in our solar system today are not the locations where Jupiter and Saturn formed, and that Jupiter and Saturn migrated from their formation locations to their present day locations, and as they did so, they crossed the two to one resonance. So this means that for every two times Jupiter goes around the sun, Saturn goes around once. And when you do that, um, it actually uh, destabilizes the orbits of the minor bodies because they get um, a, you, know, uh, 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 you know, this gravitational pull that's um, exacerbated by the two planets because they're both in the same positions, like they, they both come around to being at the same place around the sun. Right, so that, that's what destabilizes the minor bodies. Um, so, so basically, um, I spoke a little bit of some of the um, uh, sort of planetary science um, evidence for this. Um, so for example, so one, we think the asteroid belt had to be more massive. Two, when you look at the size distribution of craters on like the moon, it matches with the size distribution of bodies in the main asteroid belt. So that tells you that the projectiles are consistent with coming from the main asteroid belt. Um, so, uh, uh, so it's really become like the accepted sort of mechanism describing the period of late heavy bombardment today. I think we have time for one final question, if there is one. I think maybe we've, we've, we've done it. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks again to Dr. Christine Chen, and uh, see you in a month.